Welcome to part two of Matt and Scott and Jay Landers. Pick favorite songs from Barbara's albums. Jay knows so much about how these albums were done that it's taking us a while to get through. But we have all the time in the world. The book comes out April 24th, and you're going to go right now and pre-order the book? What book is he talking about? Thanks for asking. I'll answer that question. We have a book about the music career of Barbara Streisand that Matt Howe has written. He's run the Barbara Streisand archive.com. I don't think it's actually .com. I think it's .org or whatever. Just Google Barbara Streisand archive and you'll be fine. And he's run that for years and he takes all that information and we cover the album. So we've been doing this show for a while. Hopefully you watched last week's where Jay walked us through just for the record. On this show, we're going to cover The Prince of Tides and Back to Broadway. And then we're going to have part three. I mean, Jay is basically trying to weasel into our show. That's what I'm getting. So enjoy part two of Jay Landers joins Matt and Scott as we talk about Barbara. Okay. So now we're up to The Prince of Tides, which, yes, I'm holding this vinyl, but don't think that means it's available in America because it's not and it needs to come out because it's great. But this is actually from either Spain or Greece was the only country where it came out. And I had I paid some money for it, which is fine because my kids didn't need to go to college. You know what? They'll be fine. Uh, but it's worth it because I love this album so much. And my pick is For All We Know, which really would be in my top three Barbara songs of all time. Um, her, just like every word, every note, the way she says night and she says it differently. And I think, I'm sure it's because she was really channeling Lowenstein. And of course, we all know Barbara does best when she's acting and singing. That's that's what she does and you just can feel it. Oh my God, it's such a great song. And I, I just absolutely love For All We Know. Well, you've uh, got only one other choice, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say- you care uh, to agree. <laughs> well, I was gonna say For All We Know was a great uh, get off the stage song for her concert tour in 94, um, before she came back for the encores. It was, I mean, just a great, and I just remember she would say, uh, for all we know, we may never meet again. And the entire audience would go, oh, <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's live performance. That's, I miss that. Um, but I'm going to give an, uh, an, honorable, an honorable mention because I do like uh, James Newton Howard's um, score. Did I get oh. that right? No, yeah, James what? Newton Howard. James Newton beautiful. Howard. I love his score, so I'm going to give the end credits an honorable honorable mention um, because they're just so beautiful. Mm. But you know, between the two Streisand vocals, I'm actually going to choose "Places That Belong to You." That's been my favorite song for ages. Mm. Um, after uh, I had a bad breakup a couple of years ago, I definitely shed some some tears <laughs> listening to that song. And um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give a, a, a good credit to Marty Page too. Thank you, Jay, for telling me how to pronounce his name right. Uh, who did the arrangement on that song? Uh, mm -hmm. I mispronounced his name in an earlier episode, so apologies. But um, Places That Belong to You, oh God. And it's just um, the Bergman lyrics. I got to interview them um, years ago and I, I definitely asked them about the song. And I just remember they told me that um, it's, you know, it's, it's totally in the wheelhouse of what they do, which is, you know, a, a love lost and, you know, like, almost like the way we were. But um, what a great song, my favorite. Well, that was a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of James Newton Howard's earliest film scores. I don't know if it was mm. his very first, but it was certainly early on in his illustrious career. Yeah. Uh, James was a friend of the Bergmans and they introduced him to Barbara. Um, mm. the original, the, the first iteration of the score for uh, Prince of Tides was written by John Barry. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and John wrote a few cues. I've never heard them. I don't, I don't even know if they've ever been recorded, but I know that he wrote a few cues and uh, as brilliant as he was, and he was brilliant, uh, they weren't sitting exactly right for Barbara. And then- yeah. uh, she was discussing this, I suppose, with the Bergmans. And then they said, what about our friend James? And she said, well, 
you know, and so on and so forth. And she was, I was there for the recording of the whole thing. And oh. she was, you know, I've, I've said to Barbara a lot of times, you know, you'll see on her films, it'll say, you know, uh, clothes from Miss Streisand's closet. Uh, <laughs> you know, she gets different kind of credits, but the one thing she rarely did up until the time that we met, I would say never did, was take credit for the arrangement. When, mm. when every single album that I was, that I've been involved in, she is integrally involved in the arrangements. And, you know, I made a, uh, I sort of digress for a moment. I've made, uh, I think, 13 albums with Johnny Mathis. Mm. And in none of those records, and Johnny Mathis is a great artist and parenthetically probably Barbara's favorite male singer. Mm -hmm. And um, in not one of those sessions over 13 albums, has he ever said, oh, I don't really like that arrangement. Let's, can't we do it like this? Can't we do it like this? <laughs> and I asked him huh. why, and, and I asked him why. And he said, you know, I know what I'm doing. You know what you're doing. The arranger knows what they're doing it's probably going to work out. And if it doesn't, we'll record another song. So he's like so easygoing about it. Uh, it's, he's not tortured by any of it. It's his main thing is, am I going to miss my golf, golf tea time? Right? <laughs> but, but he's very confident in the people that he works with to try to give him the best that they can give him. Barbara is the complete opposite in that she is mm -hmm. so hands-on that she deserves to be listed as the arranger, uh, co-arranger, certainly, of, uh, of the songs that she works on. Every single arrangement has her, you know, fingerprints on it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, she worked really closely with James, and, and he's gone on to he's sort of like the Diane Warren of film scorers. I don't think he's won an Oscar, but he's been nominated a lot of times and he's done incredible amount of good work. Um, but I don't think he'd, he's ever done a more romantic and kind of unified score as Prince of Tides. Partially that the story lent itself to that, but I would say that is in large measure due to Barbara's influence on his writing. And uh, funny enough, as a kind of a side note, that score is one of the most licensed scores by other studios for their temp tracks. When they oh. want to put out a trailer, but the score isn't written yet, they, yeah. they find sections of Prince of Tides to, to use. So it's it has had a kind of a, a very rich but quiet afterlife. That's um, so interesting. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful score. score. Like, um, just like I will when, say, it's just amazing that it didn't win the Oscar. I mean, it really we don't want to get into that because I don't remember what been. what it was up against, but it had to have been something pretty great. Probably Silence of the Lambs. That's what but, kind of run. Is that what won? I don't know, but it won so much know. that year. But it isn't as good as the Prince of Tides. The movie it's, isn't it, as good. But let's not fight about it. We don't but don't get me started on the Prince of Tides and the Oscars. No, it's an exceptional score. And um, as far as um, for all we know, I remember so vividly uh, that was Bar Barbara liked that song, loved that song, and always wanted to sing it. And there was a scene in a it was in a. <laughs> Not a nightclub, but it was like it was a the rainbow was a, room. Rainbow room, thank you. And it was at the top of a tall building and very, you know, great scenery outside. And she and um, and she goes there, and there's an instrumental version of it being played. Mm -hmm. But as luck would have it, when Barbara told me about "For All We Know," I was working with a great jazz musician named Kirk Whalem, and Kirk, a saxophone player. And Kirk had recorded a version of For All We Know. So 
uh, we were in New York and I was sitting with Barbara in her trailer. And I remember she was, it's kind of a running joke that she's always doing three things at the same time. Like not little things, like directing a movie, building a house and, <laughs> you know, something else. So at, in this particular time, she was directing the Prince of Tides. She was building the home that she currently lives in. Long distance, she was supervising various things. And I'm sitting there waiting for my little moment and in the trailer. And finally, I get to play her Kirk's version of it. And she goes, boy, that's exactly what we need. Uh, mm. And then hired Kirk to be the guy to play it in the rainbow room. And then she, oh. decided, and then she decided after that to do a vocal version of it. That was never the intention originally to have a vocal version. That was like a bonus cut on the album. Um, but the debate about whether to sing an end title song uh, was, I remember it like it was yesterday, the film studio was desperate for her to sing an end title yeah. song because an end title song is the ultimate promotion for a movie. And the Bergmans, of course, were eager for her to sing it because it's one of their lyrics. And Barbara was like, but Dr. Lowenstein is not a singer, right? So it would really break the fourth wall for Dr. Lowenstein slash Barbara Streisand to suddenly burst out in song. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was game to try because there are instances where you know, well, you could say, well, the teapot really saying Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> How did Evo Bryson get into the picture? So was, there are some, you know, exceptions to the rule. She was game to try. But ultimately, uh, she just had to side with uh, her directorial instincts, which is that mm -hmm. Dr. Lowenstein should not be bursting out into song at the end of the movie. Uh, nevertheless, it, it became another good bonus song so that's yeah. and the record was very successful it was a platinum soundtrack is uh, that your pick yeah which one is your pick are you picking or are you abstaining <laughs> i like for all we know good job uh, that's the right answer no i actually <laughs> love places that belong to you i love it it's just that i love 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 for all we know like yeah. it's serious Wait, i have to i have Go to ahead. add one more thing just yeah. I, I just have to tell you about the trip i took like about a month or two ago me and my my best Barbara buddy Matt Clinton went to Beaufort, South Carolina, and we visited all the locations oh, wow. uh, that she filmed, uh, and even the uh, hotel that she stayed in. And of course, they have photos of all the cast on the bookshelves in the drawing room. Yeah, it was it was really beautiful. What a beautiful uh, town! It was a great little visit, and it was warm weather. You know, it was before fall came, but anyway. I, it was fun. Well, she she really as a director, she really captured that beauty in the in those. Um, oh yeah, you know, scenes. And of course, the song that we the the album that we played our entire visit was the Prince of Tide soundtrack. Of course, so. <laughs> da, da, da. it's really it's a hummable score. Oh, totally. It is. Totally. In fact, I wish they would put lyrics to the main theme too. I think that could also da, be da, a great Um I, I've actually thought about doing it a couple of times, but it's so weird that you said you went somewhere with your best Barbara buddy, because I don't remember us taking that trip. <laughs> hmm. That I don't understand. I guess he misspoke, Jay. Uh, that's what I'm going with. Um, while we're here promoting other people's books, I'm actually working on a book right now about the movies of the 90s, where I pick two movies a year, and I'm writing essays about them. And my pick for 92 is, of course, The Prince of Tides, oh, not because of Barbara. It really is, and I truly believe it's one. it is certainly the best film of that year. Mm. And I've been watching a bunch of 90s movies and I'm trying, I've been reaching out. Um, I want to get the person that co-wrote with uh, Pat Conroy to do an interview because obviously- Becky Johnson? Pat. Yeah, I've been trying to search for her, but I haven't been able to find her because I'm assuming Barbara's probably not going to want to talk to me. But I, um, 
<laughs> I honestly think it's one of the best movies of the 90s. And again, it has nothing to do with me being a fan of her as a singer, because as you said, she doesn't sing in the movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it, it's, a, it's a beautifully crafted movie. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. If, mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it since it came out, watch it again and you will be blown away at what an adult movie it is and i mean that in all the best ways which is sure. what i'm sort of focusing on in my book that we used to make movies for adults and it grossed like 80 million dollars or something mm. i mean it did really really well for a full drama but again we're not here to talk about anyone's book except matt's um, so we are now going to back to Broadway again. I have a vinyl, but it's not available in America. This also came from Greece. Um, it's not the greatest quality, so I have a feeling it might be a knockoff. But I love the cover so much. I, I thought that did come out on vinyl, but I guess no, I'm sir. wrong. Okay, I'm wrong. Just but it's CD. going to. It's going to. We feel it. It's too good of an album to not be <laughs> it out. Certainly, it certainly is worthy of being on vinyl. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a Broadway box set that would have uh, all three Broadway albums with Losing My Mind and Not A Day Goes By and these bonus tracks, just take my money. <laughs> Jake on first <laughs> on an album. I feel like since you had a big part to do with Back to Broadway, um, it's got to be hard for you to pick. But what do you got from Back to Broadway? Oh, my favorite track from Back to Broadway? Yes, sir. Um, I remember the I remember the the genesis of each song uh, on that record, and there were so many highlights uh, for me uh, as an observer, uh, and you know, sort of occasional participant. But it, but really, it was so much fun watching Barbara sit at the piano with uh, Stephen Sondheim and work through the arrangements of um, "Move On" and "Children Will Listen," and you know, because all of these songs. Uh, what that period of Sondheim's uh, writing, when you listen to the cast albums, a lot of these songs are interrupted by dialogue, or you hear half of the song in the first section, and then you don't hear it again for a little while. So they weren't like written as standalone songs until Barbara and Stephen got together and really said, okay, this is what we need to turn it into a, a standalone song. And certainly children will listen um, they did that, and it's, you know, it's now like a perfect theme song for so many um, things now, social causes. Um, but I think it was, there's really two, can I share two fun stories from that? You, well, that's what we're here for. Please. <laughs> no one's tuning in to see Matt and I, I can okay. tell you. Well, one of the, one of the, if Barbara had her way, exclusively left to her own devices. She would record the most obscure songs ever written. She could de take a deep dive into Stephen Sondheim's catalog and find these gems that maybe, you know, she and three Sondheim fans and, you know, a couple of other people would be thrilled to hear her sing, but they're not yeah. commercial. Now, you even use the word commercial with Barbara, and she looks at you like you're talking in tongue because <laughs> she doesn't think about what's commercial. I've In 30 years, I've never heard her say, that sounds like a number one hit. She's just, that's the furthest thing from her mind. So, um, but as an A&R person, half of my job, more than half of my job is to help the artist realize what their vision is. But I also want to keep an eye on what I think has commercial potential. So um, the thing that worked so well, one of the many things that worked so well about the Broadway album is that it was nicely balanced between the lesser known and the shop, I don't wanna say shop worn, but the war horses. So like mm -hmm. everybody knows uh, If I Loved You, but few people knew putting it together at the mm -hmm. time. So keeping that in mind, whenever we do an album together, if it starts to lean towards the lesser known, my instinct is, you know, we need to give people a song that they can kind of like rest their brain and land for a moment before they take off on another interesting but less familiar 
half. Uh, so I said, you know, so it, it, so it started, I don't have the song titles in front of me, but uh, I said, you know, what's like the war horse song that is so overdone that it's like you can't even bear the thought of hearing it again? Some Enchanted Evening. <laughs> and she said, I, she just like was no way, I've heard that song a thousand <laughs> times, I don't need to hear it a thousand and one times. And it was quite a lively conversation. And um, I'm just gonna take a little sip of water here. Because in, in 30 years, I can tell you that I've never had an argument with Barbara. We've never had an argument. We've had some very lively conversations about should you do this song or I think you should do this song and you wanna do this song. We've had some very good conversations about that. And I think one of the things she likes about me is that I'm, um, I'm what you would call, I describe myself sort of as rigidly flexible, which is that I have a very specific reason for, I, I never play her a song and say, what do you think about this one? It's always like, I think this is worthy of your time. So mm. please, you know, so the inference being, please consider it seriously. I'm not just saying, hey, what about some enchanted evening? It's I've thought about it for a reason. Anyway, she was not inclined to do it. Um, and I asked kind of surreptitiously asked um, the genius arranger, uh, Johnny Mandel, if he could find a way to freshen this song to appeal to Barbara's sensibility. And he wrote, one of the most magnificent arrangements for any song ever. And guess what? It became the opening song on the record. <laughs> so I, I kind of lean towards that as my favorite song, but it's really not my favorite song on the record. I would have to go uh, with Children Will Listen mm. as my favorite song. Story number two. Andrew Lloyd Webber is in the midst of writing uh, Sunset Boulevard. And on paper, that just sounded to me like a home run. Hadn't seen it, hadn't heard it, didn't know anything about it. It just seemed like a good idea to me. And I reached out and, and I had uh, given Barbara memories. Memory, uh, memory. What's that? Right. It's not memories, it's memory. It's singular, right. Memory from, from cats, exactly. Yeah. As opposed to memories, da 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 da. Right, so, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, so I had this kind of, you know, tenuous association with uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber because of that. So I was able to get to his manager or somebody like that. And, and he says, absolutely, we actually do have a song in the show that is meant to be that 11 o'clock memory kind of moment. And uh, I said, well, great, can you send it to me? Because it's coming to Broadway and maybe it'll all work out and it won't fall to the wayside as Chess did, as the song mm -hmm. from Chess. It really will be a Broadway song. Weber says, the only way you're gonna hear this song is if you come to England and hear it. And really? If, sorry, if Barbara comes to England and hears it. <laughs> and I say, with all due respect, that's not gonna happen. But if you'd like to have a standard, uh, then I will come to England and I'll listen to the score. So I come to his, I, I go to London. This was in the days when record companies were willing to <laughs> indulge these kind of things. Right. I go to London and I knock on the front door of the, this beautiful townhouse kind of thing. And, uh, and Andrew opens the door. I've never met him, but certainly know what he looks wow. like, he opens the door. And as he's opening the door, I see uh, a nanny pushing a pram up the street in this charming kind of like my fair lady square that his house is situated in. And the nanny comes right up to the front door and it's his nanny and his child. And he says, Jay, I'd like you to meet my greatest production. And he introduces me to the baby. 
and I'm I don't know him, and I'm like, is that a joke or is that like, <laughs> he's so stuffy or I didn't know, but it was it was certainly a memorable moment. We go to his wow. house. We go into his house, and he proceeds to play me on piano every song from the show. And finally, he gets to the song with one look, and he says, "This is the the hit song of the show." And I, it has all of the earmarks of a classic Andrew Lloyd Webber ballad that likely would be the hit of the show. So I and I, I'm not bowled over by it, but I've often found myself in situations where I'm sitting with extraordinarily famous and accomplished people, and they're showing me their latest thing, and and I'm not bowled over by it. And part of me is going, yeah, but they're this is Andrew Lloyd Webber. Who am I to comment on on this? <laughs> and then there's the other part of me that goes, hey, I have two ears, and I know what I'm hearing and I'm loving it or not loving it. So um, I think of the time that, you know, I was in a screening room with Francis Ford Coppola and he showed me a rough cut of Godfather 3. And I'm like, gee, I know this on paper. This is like the greatest story <laughs> ever told, the Vatican and, you know, money laundering and the mafia and all this. And I just didn't get it. So I've had these kind of situations before. So I said, you know, it's a lovely song, lovely song. And he continues. And for some reason, I don't know if it was in the show. Maybe he wasn't playing me the songs in show order. I don't remember that. He plays me as if we never said goodbye. And I went, that's a song for Barbara. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you know, you, you're not saying this is the hit, but that is the song for Barbara in my not so humble opinion. He says, well, I'll give it to her, but she has to record the other. Mm. So I said, well, I'm not here to negotiate. I'll take both songs. And he gave me some rough recordings of both. And I sat down with Barbara a couple of days later in the studio and I played her both songs without any of the editorial that I've just shared with you. I just mm. said, here are two songs from the show. She immediately understood the value of it as if we never said goodbye mm -hmm. and uh and the other song she went yeah it's pretty good maybe the, uh, well they're thinking this could be the memory of this show and you know i haven't seen the show and who's to say and maybe when you see it in context it really you know starts to sail she said oh, i can record it so she was open to recording both and but mm -hmm. for me hands down the better song is as if we never said goodbye and then of course through the years, we've adapted it uh, to various circumstances, <laughs> and it's it's just a yeah. very useful song in that sense. Yeah, but I'm still going with some enchanted Eve. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll go next because I'll let Matt take take uh, the end for back to Broadway. Um, this is a rough one for me to pick because there's a lot of favorites, but I have to go with Move On because Sondheim means everything to me. And this song, it's so amazing in the show with Mandy and Bernadette that you wouldn't think it could work on its own. But Barbara's version is so different and it really becomes something else. And, and I love her version too. I don't have a favorite between them, but... Um, I got to pick move on. It's just, you know, it's so great. You got to listen to it all the way turned up too. Uh, yeah. So my pick is move on. <laughs> well, she really, I, as I think I touched upon, I have this vivid memory of her and Stephen and um, who was the arranger? Was it Paul Gimignani or? Um, Paul uh, Gimignani or, is or uh, Sondheim's. Uh, yeah, but orchestra. there was another, there was may have been another guy that was close. Michael to Starobin. Michael Starobin. Starobin. Did I say it I'm wrong? Not sure. I've always said okay. Anyway, yeah. Michael Sondheim and Barbara sat at the piano for hours trying to mm. figure out edits to the song or should it be longer, should it be shorter? And it was a long process. It, they probably sat there for 10 hours mm. and uh, in her apartment in New York. And they finally came to uh, an agreement about how long the song should be and the the dips and 
highlights of the orchestration, et cetera, et cetera. And it was uh, it's a remarkable song. It is. It's just beautiful. So Matt, well, what do you got? I'll say two. I have two things I want to say. Um, first, regarding Move On, you know, Sunday in the Park with George is one of my favorite Sondheim musicals almost ever. That and Merrily, we, we roll along. And uh, what, what you were just saying is, you know, in show, in show context, Move On is, you know, uh, no one's for me, George. So she's talking to the character. But the, the, the brilliant thing they did for Barbara's version is they replaced, uh, Sondheim replaced George with words like though and no. So it takes it out of you know that specific show context and makes it more universal and more singable and it's just so brilliant what they did and it's subtle it's not they're not huge changes that that Sondheim made but I, I do like that just so much love that song um, the second thing I was going to say is um, uh, Scott encouraged me to be critical in the book that I've written and I I am very critical. Uh, with Back to Broadway. I, I, I don't like this album a lot. And I, I think it has, I think David Foster maybe overproduced it a bit. I, I think it has a, a really 90s sound to it. I, I wish it just were more or, orchestral instead of all the synthesizers and stuff. I mean, that's just my sort of beef with the album, shall we say. But um, like, for instance, I think uh, the Encore album, even though it, uh, it, it uses um, synthesized, uh, music, it sounds just more Broadway to me. And for some reason, back to Broadway sounds less, even less than the Broadway album. Mm -hmm. But that's just my my little uh, thing with this. Oh, here comes my cat. Everybody's oh, entitled to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And listen, I love, I love David Foster's work on other songs that he's done for Barbara. Mm -hmm. I love David Foster's work on with Celine Dion and uh, you know everybody. I, you know, it's not like I- David produced, like five songs on the album, maybe he didn't do yeah, the whole some, album. some, not the whole album, but a lot of the songs. Mm -hmm. And Barbara produced the the Lloyd Webber songs, which are beautiful. And the Sondheim you know? ones. And the Sondheim ones. I mean, so it's interesting. But here's my choice. So um, I've never been in love before. I just think it's sort of the most understated. Uh, songs on the album. It's got a beautiful arrangement. I love that, that she slowed it down. Um, you know, in, in, in the show, if you've, if you've ever seen the movie Guys and Dolls or seen it live on stage, you know, it's not quite that um, ballad-like. Uh, and I love that she's, she sings it like that. I love Guys and Dolls. I mean, what a great musical. Um, and I also think that it sort of grounds the album. I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, luck be a lady and you know, it's, there's a lot going on and then all of a sudden I've never been in love before comes on and just sort of quiets us and gives us some breathing space. And so I love that song, so beautiful. Well, th these, those are all valid um, valid observations. You know, luck, I've never been in love before. Of course, I think Barbara would say that her first uh, crush, movie star crush was Marlon Brando. And so, right. um, in that, that's the song I believe that in concert she replaced her face, uh, put her face into the. Uh, well, I'll, I'll know. I'll know from. That's guys all I'll know. I'm yes. sorry. Right right, 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 right. But I've never been in love before is a great song from that score, and so mm -hmm. you know she had a definite personal love of that entire score. Uh, yeah. But but particularly because you know, of because of the Brando connection. Further to your thought about uh, the synthesizer-y um, over, overlay of some of the songs, um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the challenges of making this record um, from the a &R point of view was that she had made the hugely successful Broadway album, and which I think is in the, you know, certainly the top three of all of her albums in terms of yeah. it's, fully, it's a fully realized vision and uh and then she tried through the through a, over a couple of years with different producers to do a worthy sequel and by the time i came into the picture she she sort of thought she said to me you know i've kind of done all the broadway songs that i like 
because they had sifted through hundreds of songs to arrive at the, you know, the 12 that were on the Broadway album. So it was not like, oh, well, I mean, there's, of course, you can go to any, what was that great store on the corner of uh, Broadway where you could buy the mm. sheet music? I know exactly what store you mean, and it's out of business, and it breaks my yeah, little colony, heart. Colony, Colony. Yes. It was colony the Records. Store ever. Yeah, you could go to Colony and get any compilation of Broadway's greatest hits, and every song is worthy of singing, but it's whether she feels a commitment or a connection to those songs. Mm -hmm. So yes, you could name 50 Broadway songs that she should sing uh, or that fans think she should sing, but she has to love it. Right. So, um, uh, so when we chose songs like Luck Be A Lady, well, she can't, everybody hears Luck Be A Lady today and they think of Frank Sinatra's version. Right. right. It's, because it's so- It's important. swinging. Yeah. So we needed to find different ways to present these songs. And, you know, when David came in um, with this kind of the, the sound of the clinking coins coming out of the slot machines and all that <laughs> stuff, she loved it. And so that's why mm -hmm. we, we went with that. I'll give you a, okay, here's an, a little exclusive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we had come up, and when I say we, I really mean we. I don't really remember if it was my idea or her idea, but collectively we had come up with the idea of doing anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> and David Foster then created a demo and we said, well, who could we do this with? And we chose Madonna and Bet. So it was gonna be a three of them. Wow. And then, and then the end of the record, was going to, after they had done, you know, I can do anything, you can do anything, and then the record comes to a close, we would hear them in the ladies' room, and we'd hear Madonna and Barb and Beth going, you know, gosh, she's such a bitch, and she's so controlling, and this and that, and the other way, and blah, 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 blah. and then we'd hear the, another stall open and go, ladies, I'm in here, <laughs> and that's how the song was going to end. And David created this brilliant arrangement, which starts off very much like we all know the song. But then when it came time to do uh, Madonna's section, anything, you, any song you can sing, I can sing, whatever it was, he went mm -hmm. into a Madonna disco beat. Mm -hmm. and, when, oh. and when it was Beth's turn to, to, for her, what she can do better, he went into kind of like a uh, wind beneath my wings kind of motif. <laughs> and, and so it, it, it touched upon their sounds. And I love it. Really clever. And then of course, my job was to wrangle all of this talent and they all agreed. And then Madonna mm -hmm. at the 11th and a half hour couldn't do it for some reason. Oh. So that's, that's one of those fish that got away stories. Wow. Yeah. That would have been incredible. I love it. <laughs> and if Madonna saw this video that we're making right now, she'd go, nobody ever showed, told me that that was a <laughs> you know. So I don't really know whether she passed on it or somebody passed on on, on her right. behalf or whatever, but it would have been fun. Well, and she's also, a multitasker too. So who knows, yeah. Madonna may have been juggling, you know, a who tour knows? and an album and a TV just, show and a movie. It would have been fun. Yeah, and if Madonna's yeah. at home watching us, I'm sorry, Madonna, you must yeah. have something better to do than watch us. Um, the, the last thing I want to say about Back to Broadway, this is just like a memory of mine. I uh, was in college when it came out and I drove to another college for the weekend to visit a friend and I was driving around campus with the windows down with everybody says don't blasting and I thought hey this album's number one because it was the number one album that week and I was like I'm not the strange person listening to Barbara on a college campus this is the number one album I'm, yeah. I'm as cool as can be not so I had a, a, a you, you make a uh, you remind me of a fun memory um, when we got the news that the album was going to go to number one the, the person who told me that was the then chairman of Columbia Records and he said, you really, you know, 
send, please send her a bottle of champagne or whatever it was right away to tell her this good news. So I, I was in New York and, uh, and I found out that she was having dinner with a group of friends at a small Italian restaurant, which I don't remember the name of, but it was like her haunt. And I showed up at the restaurant un, uninvited and, uh, <laughs> and I saw them in the corner. It was a group of about 10 people. And just at that moment, they were serving dessert. So I kind of swooped in and I said, I have a dessert for you and, uh, you know, or surprise uh -huh. or whatever it was. And I gave her the bottle and I said, you're number one. And everybody <laughs> got excited. There we go. That's the end of part two. Next week, we'll have part three with Jay when we talk about the concert, which is my all time favorite. You don't love the concert. I love the concert. And also on that episode, we're going to have a couple side things um, that Jay talked about as well. So we'll finish up Jay Landers next week, and then it'll be back to just, you know, boring Scott and Matt. Please remember, go out and pre-order the book. It helps us. And the book's coming. It's coming soon, okay? It's on its way. So get out there to TuckerDSPress.com and order the book, and we'll see you next week.